computers and email addresses, especially email addresses. Actually, Pearl likes to collect phone numbers because Pearl is a texter. Jennifer likes email addresses <laughs> because she is an email person. She may be a texter too. I'm a hit or miss when it comes to email. I sometimes remember to check it, and sometimes I don't. Okay, Carrie, she's ready. You're up and going. All right, we are so glad to have you with us. I don't think I see anybody new, but if, well, I'll take that back. We do have new people. Obviously, I am not Jennifer. My name is Pearl Hudgens, and I'm the blessed to be the women's ministry leader for the Kernsville Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we are presenting this. She consented to come do this for us. So, that being said, I don't know. I, I remember, but anyways, I'm going to let Jennifer just do her thing. Okay. But I will say a prayer first. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that each one of us could be here today. Lord, we know that you knew we would be here even before we came. You know our hearts. what Jennifer has to share this afternoon. And we just thank you and we praise you for all the wonderful gifts that you give us. And we ask for a special outpouring of your spirit this afternoon. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray, amen. So if you guys would like to stay in touch with me, I'm gonna give you a way right now. I'm gonna pass around a mailing list sign up. You have to write clearly because I I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. I have to be able to read your writing. But please sign the mailing list. You will receive updates as to events and different things that are going on where I'm speaking, sometimes different workshops that I do. You're gonna receive probably one or two emails a week. We won't overwhelm you. And you'll receive the blogs that I write. So you'll get a link to those. And it's just a really good way to stay in touch with all that's going on. So I'm gonna send that around. I'm gonna use the book 13 Weeks to Peace as the kind of the base for this. If you want, I brought eight copies of this. All I had was a carry-on, so I brought eight copies, but we will have them tomorrow for you if you would like to purchase one. And that's what I've been preaching from this weekend. So go ahead and pass that around. Here's the pen. And I would like to ask all of you um, to weigh in on what has been a blessing to you so far. So if it's okay, we will have someone run around wildly with this microphone. Maybe I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Want me to do it? Okay. You won't be able to see me? So I have to go up there. All right, I'll go up here. Yeah. So last night you couldn't you couldn't put it online. You couldn't see me. Okay. But they couldn't see me, apparently. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'll stay up here. So what has meant something to you so far? What has been meaningful? What has been helpful? What just stuck in your mind from what I have shared so far? I want to hear back from you. So this is your chance to share. Just raise your hand and Joni will come running to you. There's a little sweetheart up there. Oh, yes. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I didn't get to hear much of what you said today. But Hold it right up on your mouth. I didn't get to hear much of what you okay. had to say because I was in the kitchen, but I got to thinking about Daniel. 
what you said about Daniel. Uh huh. And you know, he to me, he's just the epitome of what people should be. Yeah. You know. And but it probably was due to some degree to what he went through. If he had a nice, easy life, would he have done that? Yeah. But the fact is, he went through all those yeah. troubles, and it made him stronger. It made him do not not afraid to do yeah. what he he had to do. But so it was the I captivity that prepared him for the lion's den. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So Powerful. I thought that was wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else? She said that Daniel, you know, was prepared basically for his whole life and all the challenges he faced as high-level executive, I guess you could say, in Babylon, living in a culture that was opposed to everything he had known. And he was prepared for that by the trauma of being deported. Go ahead. I really enjoyed the post-traumatic stress growth slide along with the Regrets of the Dying? Yes. Isn't that powerful? That was very powerful. I thought, oh, that's really neat. I took a picture of that. Some people don't get that, but to me it's so obvious. Like, God lets you go through these little dry runs so that when it comes to the big stuff, you don't make any huge mistakes. You know, you cover everything you need to cover in your life, everything you need to finish up in your life, everything you need to embrace in your life. God is going to make sure that you get that. And he gives us trials to kind of sober us up and make sure that nothing is neglected. So I love that. I love that research. I think it's quite... And the TED Talk she gives, Jane McGonigal, is quite compelling. All right, anybody else? Excellent points here. Talk to me. What has meant something to you so far? What has stuck in your mind? Or if you just want to rebuke me for something or tell me you hate my clothes, I, you know, whatever. This is your time. Um, for me was the fact that despite the trauma that, you know, people go through, there is still hope in uh -huh. light at the end of the tunnel. Um, as I was listening to the sermon, I was thinking of different friends that have their trauma or even myself, and I just really wanted to share that message with others. So thank you for sharing. Hey, ma'am, there is hope if you've been traumatized, you've been damaged, you've been hurt, but there is healing and even greater thriving and flourishing as a result of that trauma. Go ahead, uh, Tracy. I think that's Tracy. Yes, it's me. Uh -huh. um, you stole my, I was gonna say the same thing as I was telling you, um, that there's hope. Um, I guess I've mentioned this to you that God can use our pain and make it our ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said to you that a lot of ministries have come from mm -hmm. our deepest pain. Mm -hmm. And that's very encouraging that when we go through things, we don't have to feel hopeless when we can turn our eyes to Jesus because he will turn that around and make it our greatest blessing. He can take our greatest pain and turn around and make it our greatest blessing. And so I'm grateful for that. That is so good. And that's Second Corinthians, I think it's chapter 1. It says that we comfort others with the same comfort wherewith we were comforted of God. So the wounds that we incur, God comforts us, and then we get that comfort from him. We can share that with others. The Bible is very clear that that is how that works. So every trial, uh, every setback is a setup for a comeback, and every trial is a potential testimony, isn't it? Beautiful. By the way, I'm working with my, um, some of my teammates in Abide Network. There's one individual in particular. We want to do some research on a treatment for trauma that involves walking. Because there's a type of treatment, oh, I'm not supposed to go down here. Um, there's a type of treatment called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. How many have heard of that? Where you use your eye movements going back and forth to condition the brain to be able to deal with highly emotionally charged material is the thinking, is that the eye movements actually condition the brain to be able to do that better. Here comes the massage therapist lugging that podium. And I like it, but there are aspects of EMDR that, off, that they, they put some people on edge. They feel like it's too new AG, and depending on how it's done, sometimes I get uncomfortable. But I don't think that the basic principle is incorrect. I think that your brain does improve when you're stimulating alternately both sides of the body. 
and it does put your brain in a condition where it can handle more difficult material. It makes your brain work better, basically. But to me, the best example of that is Walking, I mean, this is what I do when I'm troubled, when I have a difficult problem to work through, when I was trying to figure out what to do for my doctoral dissertation research project, I walk and it seems to make my brain work better. And so my thinking and what our thinking is, is that maybe we can use that walking as a treatment for trauma and help bilateralize people's brains and then talk through the trauma in the context of a walking experience. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I keep wandering down there. I've got to stay up here. This is terrible. It's rough. It's 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 hard. Like you're in prison. I'm so sorry. It is. Um, How far can I go? Can I go this far? Can I go this far? <laughs> What's that? To the first step? <laughs> can I go there? They don't have slideshows for right. me. All right. That's the difference. Um, you were talking about the eye exercise. Yeah. I had trouble with the inner ear, and you were talking about the brain. When people have trouble with the inner ear, it can be several things, but one thing more is you're actually retraining your brain. I had to do all kinds of wild, wacky exercises. And one of the yeah. ones they had me do was where you looked over here, and then you looked to the other, and I was supposed to go as fast as I could between the two, mm -hmm. um, having to stand up and turn in circles and all kinds of other weird stuff. Mm -hmm. But it does help train the brain. And that's what you're doing with inner ear. Mm -hmm. Actually, your eyes are telling your brain one thing. Mm -hmm. Your ears are telling your brain something else. Mm -hmm. And you are retraining it mm -hmm. to marry back together. Mm -hmm. So I would think that this is doing a similar mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. That's correct. You're, you can do a lot to shape your own brain. And a lot of these kind of therapies really are that. But to me, if you use some of those techniques that are effective and scientifically validated, and then you have God in the mix and the power of the Holy Spirit, I mean, it's gonna be incredible. So I like to take from all the different therapies and try to find what's biblical, what seems you know solid and stable from scripture, at least the principles are there in scripture, and then try to create my own interventions, and it seems to be working and helping people. Anybody else, has anything meant something to you or been interesting for you or do you have any questions? This is your time, this is your time to weigh in and to be heard. Does anyone have any questions or comments? mentioned something else that we as a church we can be a blessing for those who gone through things mm -hmm. as a buffer to yeah. help them get through that so I thought that was very interesting because um you know connections just someone agreeing with your pain mm -hmm. they haven't gone through it but they acknowledging that the pain is real can help a person it's like you believe me like if I came to you with a hurting story just the fact that you believe me can help me to get over or to deal with my, my trauma. That's you, right. You believe me. You didn't judge me. You believe me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. Good listening, active listening, has been shown to be extremely powerful in facilitating healing, calming people down, diffusing tension and hostility. It's an incredible tool that is actually found in Scripture. Let every man be quick to what? Quick to speak? Quick to hear. Slow to speak. So the scripture tells us to reverse our natural tendency, which is to put out our own opinion, talk about our own experience, talk about ourselves, and just kind of not care too much about other people. And the Bible tells us to flip that. And instead of always speaking, hear. And it says the result of that will be a lowered level of what the Bible calls wrath. In my thinking, wrath is hostility. That can be external hostility where people are fighting with each other, but it can also be some people internalize stress and they become hostile to themselves and that can produce health problems. So that listening, like you said, is so power, like Tracy said, is so powerful to heal people and all you have to do is listen and hear them 
and weep, maybe weep with them, as the scripture says. And in and of itself, that can be a huge agency of healing in that person's life, even just one conversation where someone listened. Um, and the church can fulfill that role in a powerful way with a few tools. I like to teach those tools. I like to give people those tools because the church, like I said, can be a great mental health agency in the world. So I'm really excited. You know, at the beginning of COVID, it was really cool how this mass trauma, never in my lifetime had there been something that impacted everyone in the world at once. It was kind of a golden opportunity and kind of a cool moment, as disturbing and distressing as it was. And initially there was this pulling together where people were like, we, if we're gonna beat this, we gotta work together. And the church pulled together and the church became, even though we were all online and everything, really supportive. I mean, I have a Bible study on Friday nights that still draws between 50 and 70 people. And it started at the beginning of COVID and formed a fellowship. So it's a church, you know, and the church on a broad scale started to pull together and people started learning how to use technology, which they never had before as much. But then the polarization came in and then all the fights about the vaccine and then all the different opinions about the masks and people started to polarize and pull apart, which just gave the devil such a victory because that was an opportunity, that trauma was an opportunity to pull us together and the church could have been a real agency of healing in the world. I was disappointed with how things went. Not totally, but somewhat disappointed with the polarization. So anyone else? What has meant something to you? What has been helpful to you? What questions do you have? Or what don't you like about me? Go ahead. Well, first of all, I like you, and I appreciate <laughs> you being here, so yeah. Um, one of the things I thought about is, as you were talking, and you were sharing how people kind of recover from traumas. Yeah. I've been involved with the 12-step recovery program for about the last 16 or 17 years. Amen. And, and you see a lot of people that come through that have inflicted trauma as they were abusing drugs and alcohol. So they inflicted trauma on other people mm -hmm. and they've had trauma affect them mm -hmm. um, because of the state that they were in. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the principles that they really preach and practice in, in that recovery program is, you know, the idea that we'll see how our experience can benefit others. Mm -hmm. You know, and that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Um, because, okay, so you ask, how can what I've been through with using and then recovering, how can right. that benefit? So then you're saying the uselessness and self-pity that people often feel when they've kind of wrecked their life right. disappears because, because God, they're helping others. God, God repurposes the, their mistakes. God repurposes that. Yeah, and it's been yeah. touched on before. Tracy touched on mm -hmm. it a little bit too. But, um, mm -hmm. I mean, that is such a powerful concept and principle in, in the recovery program mm -hmm. is, you know, yeah, bad things have happened to us, uh, you know, myself included, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't have to be our identity. We can, we can look at that experience and go, how can I take that and, and use that to be a blessing to mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. and give others a hope and get the focus off myself mm -hmm. and the focus on the helping other people. And that's just, I've just noticed, you, mm -hmm. you know, I see a rebirth of people, complete rebirth in these in these programs. Beautiful. And that's a Christian principle, but I see it in this 12-step recovery program, which has I mean, pr Christian principles that is foundation. Very much. Very, very much, much Christian yeah. principles. They come straight from the Bible. But, uh, you know, that's that's just something I thought about is, mm -hmm. is how important it is. It's okay to acknowledge. It's okay to accept that something's been done, but you kind of mm -hmm. have to, as quick mm -hmm. as you can, mm -hmm. in the appropriate amount of time, mm -hmm. start thinking about how can I use this experience to try to help somebody else's suffering. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I have a friend who is a real big kahuna in the Celebrate Recovery world, which is kind of a Christian version of the 12-step program. He lives in Oregon. His name is Jonathan Patton, and he was addicted to meth for 30 years. I tell him, I don't know why you still have your teeth and your hair, dude, because usually when people are addicted to meth, they go downhill very rapidly and typically die if they don't get clean but he was addicted for 30 years and somehow made it through and he has a whole story around it. And now he's a big leader in the 12 step world or the recovery world out there. And whenever I have someone that needs good news, who's fallen hard into addiction and is in that state where they're full of self pity and regret, I refer them to Jonathan. 
Did you want to say something, sweetheart? You sure? It has Christian roots, and it's certainly governed by. When my father used to go, it wasn't the thing. You know, now mm-hmm. it talks about higher power, and I'm trying to remember all the stuff because mm-hmm. I've been to the other side, mm-hmm. the, the side for the people who are supporting the mm-hmm. addicts. But originally, it was all about getting to know mm-hmm. God. It was mm-hmm. how to have a relationship with God. And then society changed it so that it's more your higher power and all this other kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, what the reason they did it that way is because they didn't want to exclude people who were not religious. So they find a very tactful way of introducing God. They basically let people know you're not going to change without power. And that's pretty, that's pretty revolutionary because the world's way of helping people is very humanistic. You've got the power within you. Well, 12 Steps says, no, you don't. (laughs) You wouldn't be where you're at if you have the power within you. So you need power from outside. And they do it in this way that allows non-religious people to come. It's a great, there's so many believers in the 12-step world. Don't you find that to be true? And they just apply, you know, they they give it a name, you know. But there are so many believers throughout. The principles are all solid. Go ahead. Joni's getting her afternoon walk in. By the way, if any of you start falling asleep, we're going to start doing like head, shoulders, knees, and toes, mm-hmm. and I'm going to point to you, and you're going to be very humiliated, so I'm just letting you know. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know studies or your experience on dealing with denial, people that deny that mm-hmm. they have trauma mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Yeah. they're acting inappropriate in response to stress. Yeah. If you, if you occurred, you, you got traumatized in a family where vulnerability and weakness were considered sinful and wrong, and vulnerability and weakness were a liability, if you showed any vulnerability or weakness, you would be harmed by someone else or dominated or criticized. If you grew up in that environment, it's so risky to admit that you have unresolved trauma because you feel like you're exposing yourself to being attacked. And so it's going to be extra hard for those people. And then the sad thing is that often the traumas occurred in that context. So I think you have to recognize that and know that it's going to be a longer road for that person, but also try to create an environment as much as you can where it's okay to be weak and it's okay to admit, you know, um, struggles. A lot of what we can do, this within the realm of all our possibility, is watch your criticism to, watch your negative feedback to positive feedback ratio in your relationships. That ratio needs to be six to one or f- five to one, some, some authorities say, for it to be a healthy relationship. That means you say five nice things to that person for every one negative feedback you give. You can give negative feedback. You have to be able to give negative feedback. It's just not realistic to give no negative feedback in a relationship because you have to work things out. But you should have five affirmations to one criticism, and I find, out, I find that almost without exception, it's the reverse. If people ever affirm at all, many family cultures never affirm ever, 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 ever. So there's only negative feedback in that relationship and that creates an unsafe environment in a relationship. So one thing you can do if you wanna try to create safety in your relationships is affirm people and do it liberally and do it often. I have had to learn this. I grew up in a critical home and I have had to learn with my husband not to be like, did you take the, did you do that? Did you do this yet? Is this, this is so messy over here, you know. I've had to learn how to say, you look really nice in that color. I really like that. And thank you so much for uh, painting the pool deck. And you did a really good job on the lawn today or whatever, you know. Just say a lot of nice things. It really does change things. It's such a simple step, but it's really powerful. Okay, anyone else? Questions, comments, feedback? Yeah, I was just going to 
ask you from your perspective and how can we as church and men and women, especially for men, I think, yeah. be more approachable to each other because often we don't want to talk to one another and how... At we, all? But no, no, you know, they don't, people, <laughs> we talk, no, no, deeper on the, on the deeper level. Okay. Of, you know, how are you doing today? Well, often we're not doing fine. And the, how can we just be more approachable, more yeah. open, more, I don't know. The best tool that I've ever learned, and this actually worked with when they tried to bring the Waco, Texas disaster under control, many people don't know there were two units in the FBI. There was the negotiation unit and the tactical unit. And the tactical unit is what got involved when the whole place went up in flames. But what we don't talk about much is that the negotiation unit preceded the tactical unit and the negotiation unit, from my understanding, was led out by a guy named Gary Nosner. And Gary Nosner used active listening techniques in talking to David Koresh, who was a stark, raving, mad, lunatic, crazy guy, but he was a highly intelligent human being. And this man just on the phone engaged David Koresh and got him to talk. And David Koresh basically wanted his views on the seals of the book of Revelation to be published. And this is before the internet, so we couldn't do it on the internet. And so Gary Nosner was listening to him and talking to him. All he did is two things. You can boil active listening down. It's more complex than this, but I can boil it down very simply for you into an acronym, E-A-R, empathy equals ask and reflect. So if you want to show up in a capacity of empathy in people's lives, use asking questions uh, from a, a place of loving curiosity. And I'll tell you this about asking those questions. Try to use the words what and how to start the question, and I'll show you why. If you start the question with, with why, it can sound like an accusation. So say someone comes to church and you know that they're living in an abuse situation, and you get into a conversation with them and they let you know that they're being abused. If you say, why do you stay with him? It can sound like an accusation. You get that? So you wanna say instead, what keeps you there? I'm interested in knowing and understanding what, because I'm sure something is keeping you there. What is it? That's a whole different way of asking it. You're getting to the same information. So ask open-ended questions with what or how at the outset of the question. And then the other part is reflect. Say back to the person what you heard them say. Put it in your own words. I don't know a more powerful tool than repeating back to people what I heard. Just, I, this is what I'm hearing, that blah, 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 blah. So even if they say something really vague, like, oh, had kind of a wild week, instead of just going, uh-huh, oh, wow, okay, go, you had some really random things happen this week, huh? And then they'll give you more information. They'll say, yeah, you know, my, I, my taxes came due and I didn't have the money and had a small kitchen fire. Oh, so you have some money struggles going on, then you had a problem in your home. Yeah, and I just don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet. I just feel, and they're gonna give you more information every time you do that. It's like priming a pump. And pretty soon it's gonna be gushing. Now with some people you wish that you could <laughs> <laughs> dial it back <laughs> because some people are very good at talking about what's going on in their home so if you're one of those people or if, if you're talking to one of those this is not I'm talking about drawing out people that tend to lock things up and that is the most powerful tool I can give you Joni it, that especially repeating back or saying back to people what you heard them say in a paraphrased form super powerful to get people to feel safe and open up. So we can start with that reflective listening, very powerful tool. Okay? All right, well, let's get into this, guys. This is going to be a really, um, hopefully, helpful segment here. Father in heaven, speak through me to these beautiful people who need a message of hope and encouragement about shame, this overwhelming emotion that so many of us feel. Help us to know what to do with shame. Processing the most intense emotion known to mankind. Please 
Bless us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. A couple things happened to me when I was about this age. This is me with my guitar. I was probably 14, 15 years old. A couple of significant things happened that have to do with shame. First of all, I had a very close, how far can I go to the right or left? Are there parameters? Can I go this far? I can, okay. Am I good? Okay. Just don't go down. Be on the first step. Okay. Hopefully I'll remember that. Okay. So I was involved with church growing up. I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist, but I did attend church, and we would go on campouts. And this particular campout, everybody was smoking pot. And I ended up smoking pot with my friends and... I don't know if it was that it was cut with something that caused a psychotic break of some kind, but I really pretty much lost hold of myself for a long time and found myself just sobbing, overwhelmed with shame and guilt on this camping trip. And all I could think was I wanted to talk to my mom about it, but I was afraid to tell her, so I never did. And that was an experience that really kind of brought me to the point where I wanted to get to know God, which happened a few years down the road. But another event when I was around this age is I had a very close friend, and she and I would get into trouble together a lot. So we would play games. We would uh, run around the neighborhood. We would do all kinds of crazy things. And one of the things we did was we smoked her mom's cigarettes. I think we were about 12 years old. And if you're not used to smoking, nicotine gives you a real head rush kind of thing. We were sitting on a couch smoking these cigarettes. They were actually cigarette butts that her parents had put out in an ashtray, but it still had the same effect. And we were giggling and laughing, and we heard the door open and close. And we thought someone had come in. We panicked, ended up dropping the cigarette into the side of the couch, and it burned down into the box springs. So we got up, and it turned out it was the dog that came in, so it wasn't a person. We saw that we had burned a hole in the couch. We took a glass of water and poured it, but then we sprayed Glade, highly flammable Glade. That might have been it. I'm not sure what it was. She went to a family event. I went home. My little brother came in my room that night, eyes wide as alarm clocks. Jennifer, Sue Cook's house is burning down. I have never moved so fast in my life, rode my bike, threw my bike down when it was the crowd was too thick and ran the rest of the way to the house, wanted to tell everyone what had happened because I just couldn't bear that guilt that I was carrying. But she didn't want anyone to know, and so I carried that for months. Now, it just so happened, her, her whole house burned down. And it just so happened that her parents were in the middle of a divorce at that time. So she ended up moving a couple towns over with her dad. And I was still in touch with her, and I would send her notes. This is before uh, technology and email and this type of thing and texting. And I would send her notes. And in one of the notes, I disclosed to her about the house and that we knew how it had burned down. And her dad intercepted it. And I can still see two events. Number one, I can still see speaking to Mr. Cook, her dad, who happened to be a criminal lawyer, I kid you not, (laughs) in their sun porch room about what the consequences of my actions was going to be. And guess what the consequences were? You must tell your mother. (laughs) I had to tell... I had to tell, hey mom, by the way, <laughs> you know, I had to tell my mother. So I still remember that moment like it was yesterday. We were in a shopping mall. It's called Brownport Shopping Center. And we had just finished shopping and we're in the car. It was a rainy day. We're sitting there in the car. I thought, no time like the present. It's a depressing day and it can only get worse. <laughs> and I said, mom, do you remember the Cook's House fire? And her dark brown eyes darted around a little bit. She knew something was coming. She said, why? And I said, I was responsible, Mom. And just the shame and the guilt that I felt over that was just kind of overwhelming. So young, I became acquainted with guilt and shame of pretty, pretty massive proportions. And then I would say this, too, that things that happened to me 
also gave me a different kind of shame, some things that happened to me, not choices that I made that hurt other people, but things that other people did to hurt me. The main one was that at about the same age, I ended up on the wrong side of the mean girls in my school. And the mean girls were the girls I was trying to be friends with, but they decided that they hated me. And so from the moment I would step in the school, they would be right on top of me, belittling me, taunting me all day long. Finally, it all culminated in an event where they wanted to have a chat with me, and they accused me falsely of trying to steal a girl's boyfriend. I was terrified of this boy, I never spoke to him. But they had to make up something to do what they wanted to do to kind of motivate them through, reminds me of the story of Ellen White and how these kids made up a lie and then threw a rock at her. This is the nature of bullying, often it's under a pretense. They accused me of trying to steal this girlfriend's boyfriend away and they proceeded to drag me out. Well, I take that back. I followed them out to a baseball diamond away from the eyes of the teacher. Why did I follow them? Because I thought I had to. Because they were such dominant personalities and I thought I had to comply with them or I would be a coward or they'd pick on me more. So I went along with it because they were so strong. And they pushed me down in the grass, hiked up my, had a cute little, I had learned the hard way to dress fashionably and I, because I had worn really childlike clothes. They were when I first started school there. But this day I had a really cute sweater dress on, green and bl black and blue striped sweater dress, really cute. They pulled the whole thing up and proceeded to sexually and physically assault me. It was a group of girls with the boys watching on. It was a horrible, humiliating, traumatizing experience. And I was really never the same after that. So a combination of all those very difficult things acquainted me with what it is to do something that brings guilt and shame or to have something done to you that brings guilt and shame. But what I want to do now is I want to trace guilt and shame back to the Garden of Eden because while I believe that the experiences we have can cause those emotions and cause them to be rather overpowering, I think that there's a basic index guilt and shame in human nature as the result of the fall. So if you will recall from Genesis chapter three, and you can look at it in your Bible if you wish, there were several steps involved in what happened to humanity there in the Garden of Eden. The first step was that Eve decided to have a conversation with who? The serpent, right? And who wasn't in the conversation? Adam wasn't in the conversation. That was a mistake right there. There was a disconnect that occurred, and also a disconnect, I would argue, between Eve and God. She kind of wandered away from God's will. He told them to beware of that tree. She went near the tree anyway. As a result of the conversation she had there with the serpent, who says something very sketchy and hard to understand about, didn't God say you could eat from every tree? She compensated, I believe she compensated with tighter restrictions, the enemy was trying to leave out part of what God said. She actually added to what God said. The enemy was trying to make God seem more, you know, random and liberal. She was trying to make God seem more severe. Uh, she said back, if we even touch it, we're gonna die. So the serpent said, didn't God say you could eat from this tree? She said in so many words, if we even touch it, we'll die. And as a result of that, she became all confused about God because we know people through their words, right? And she didn't know the words of God anymore. She lost touch with who he was and what he intended. She was in a state of misapprehension. And it was as a result of that basic confusion, she partook of the fruit and we're told that she went to her husband then and he ate of the fruit and we're told the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were what? Naked. They had been naked before, but there was apparently a covering of light on them. Now they know they're naked and they feel their nakedness. And I relate to this, because I used to have a dream when I was in elementary school of showing up at school, taking my coat off, and all I had on was my underwear. And in the dream, you know, dreams are weird, right? In the dream, there was nothing I could do about it. 
I just stand there in my underwear in front of all my fellow students, and I had to just stay there all day. Now, that's not how reality is. If a child is unfortunate enough to put, forget to put their clothes on in the morning, they take off their coat and realize it. They're going to go running home and put their clothes on or something. But in my dream, I couldn't. So I understand the connection between nakedness and shame. And that's what humanity felt. It indicates that sense of extreme self-consciousness often connected to something you did or something you are, which are often connected. And they couldn't bear that experience, and so they immediately went into denial. And they decided that they were gonna try to fix the problem themselves. And the fact that they thought they could fix it themselves proved how deep was their denial. And so they denied their true condition, and out of that denial, they manufactured fig leaf garments from some tree. Now, I live in Florida. We have a couple fig leaves, uh, fig trees, and those leaves are quite scratchy. They're a little on the big side. They're kind of pliable, so I guess you could make like a little speedo and a little bikini out of it if you wanted to, but kind of uncomfortable, but that's what we're told they did. So they put those leaves on, and those leaves, those fig leaf garments, represent self-righteousness. If you remember from, I believe it's Isaiah the prophet, he said, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and they crumble up and blow away like a leaf. I think that's an allusion back to Genesis chapter 3. At any rate, those fig leaves represent human attempts to fix ourselves without God, and that's basically the same as self-righteousness. Lord, I want to make myself okay. I know I've gotten myself into trouble here, but I can manage it. I can handle it. Right there you see the denial. You don't realize that even though you've committed this sin, sin creates a God-sized problem that only God can solve. <laughs> so you don't realize it, and you think you can solve it yourself. That's self-righteousness, that is what those fig leaves represent. And then of course, it doesn't work. So when God comes into the garden in the cool of the day, how do they feel about it? Oh great, here he is again, we're all good. Yo, God, this is awesome. Is that how they felt? No, they were terrified because he's holy and they were unholy. So those fig leaves had not really helped them feel safe in their own skin, so to speak. And they began to blame each other and indirectly blamed God. Adam blamed Eve, and then Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and both of them indirectly blamed who? God, right? You guys with me? Falling asleep? Stand up. Stand up, reach for the sky, twist to the right, to the left, get your circulation going, touch your toes, go to side to side, catch your shoulders, okay, sit, all right. I'll get through this real quick. Okay, so <laughs> it won't be bad. So they start to blame each other. Now I want you to look at something else. This isn't said precisely in the passage, but you can see it. Why did Adam eat the fruit? Was he deceived? No. Timothy says he was what? Not deceived. Why did he do it? Because he couldn't imagine being separated from who? Eve. Eve. So out of love, for Eve, he chose to die with her rather than live without her, right? Follow this. But did he really know what it would feel like to have God come into the garden and actually face his demise? No, he was checked out of reality. And so when God came into the garden, he's like, oh, I really don't want to die. And so what are the first, he thinks God's coming to what? In the day you eat thereof, you will surely what? Die. So the first two words out of his mouth are the woman. woman. What does he want God to do? Oh, Adam, thank you so much for telling me that. I will nuke her instead of you. That's what, he's, that's what he wanted, right? Right? He was trying to get her to stand in his place. So she went from savior to scapegoat in the matter of a few hours. It was the same day God came into the garden in the cool of the day. It was pretty amazing. So there's this basic animosity and apathy and love is gone. Only hours before it was, oh, I can't live without you even. Now he's willing for her to die in his place. Where's all the love now, Adam? Where did it go? It's gone. 
And there's also, I think, despair. I mean, it doesn't say so in scripture, at least in Genesis 3, but can you imagine watching the leaves turn brown, feeling a chill in the wind, hearing the bird song slide into a minor key. There's despair in their hearts. They're starting to realize what they've done. And you know, God was big enough for all of that. But here, let's go back to that shame experience, and I'm going to talk to you about it a little more. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Here's a couple of experts on this experience of shame. Coping with shame is a daily, it, and what I'm trying to do here is give you a sense of the pervasiveness of shame. Coping with shame is a daily preoccupation, not shame in the big toxic sense, but in a kind of everyday way. So we kind of experience shame day in and day out. Shame is the most disturbing experience individuals ever have about themselves. No other emotion feels more deeply disturbing because in the moment of shame, the self feels wounded from within. So what do we do when we feel that sense of shame? Typically, human nature compensates for shame or tries to sort of stuff shame and compensatorily build up the self through pride and high self-esteem. So I'm creating a little diagram here where there's sort of this split in human nature where we feel our, our self-worth has been crushed by sin. But what we do to try to patch it up is basically generate narcissistic behaviors and thought patterns where we're constantly reinforcing our own pride, our own righteousness. We're right about this. Have you ever gotten in a conflict with someone and you feel compelled to rehearse your side of the conflict and the way you see it and you do it over and over and over again? That's part of this narcissistic compensation. Think about it. Like Narcissistic personality disorder is a personality disorder that basically distinguishes certain people that have extreme levels of pride and arrogance from people that have lower levels. <laughs> so if you have a diagnosable form of it, you're just kind of off the charts, proud and arrogant, right? And so narcissistic personality disorder is thought to result from extreme shame in childhood. It's thought that people that are raised with a lot of shaming on them as children or have really shaming experiences learn these comp compensatory techniques of building themselves up and comparing themselves favorably to other people. So it's just kind of interesting, isn't it, how human nature works. But here's what happens in terms of our righteousness, because I said that those fig leaves represented self-righteousness. So shame creates a worthiness vacuum in the human heart. How often do you hear people say, I feel like I'm not worthy of love? Have you ever felt that you're not worthy of love? Have you ever heard people say, I'm not worthy of love? That's that worthiness vacuum talking. Suddenly there's a sense of, I am not good enough for another to love me. And that can manifest in a couple of ways too. And you see this in religious circles. You see there are some people that get all this information about all the righteous things we should do, especially in a conservative church like Seventh-day Adventism where you have all of these rules and regulations and they're wonderful, you know, reforms that we can practice. And it's all good stuff. But what ends up happening is it becomes a source of merit for people. Do you know what I'm talking about? So you read that we should eat plant-based diet. And instead of taking it like God is trying to help me be healthier, feel better, and live longer, which is why it's there, people go, oh, well, if I follow this plant-based diet, I will be worthy. And they think it's generating merit in their life that's going to please God and make them sort of pass muster with God. Does this make sense to you guys? You know what I'm talking about? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Show me a sign of life. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So this can go either way. It can, it can go in the direction of entitlement where a person can, okay, I haven't had any dairy products for 10 years. I haven't eaten vinegar. I don't eat veganase. I know all those people over there eat veganase, but you know, I'm praying for them. 
you know. <laughs> I, have, I don't eat vegan eggs because it has vinegar, okay? And I don't, uh, I don't eat a lot of other things that those people are eating. I don't eat analogs. I don't eat oils. I don't eat salt. I have a salt-free, oil-free, sugar-free, taste-free diet. <laughs> and I am, by virtue of those things, so very righteous, and I'm praying for all of them. So some people are so confident in their own flesh that they can end up being very entitled and feel very righteous. But the majority of people I have found in a conservative kind of church culture where, unfortunately, sometimes things descend into the righteous acts we do or don't do, generating merit or not, the majority of people will feel unworthy. They may not admit it, but deep down they'll feel like, oh boy, if anybody ever found out how unworthy I am, I'd be in trouble. And then that creates an environment that can very quickly, by the way, turn into a cult where the strong, confident ones are in control and all the broken people stay broken and stay messed up. It can be very unhealthy very quickly. I was part of a ministry when I was a very young Adventist that was very into reforms. In fact, I would be shamed. I would wear long dresses like this and then I'd put pants under them to ride a bike. And I would be shamed for putting the pants on because it was considered, you know, wearing, you're not supposed to wear pants, you know, very strict about that kind of thing. And yet the leader of the ministry had sexual relationships with almost all the women in the ministry before I left. Such incredible hypocrisy. But this is exactly what was happening. He was all that, he had it all together. He sat me down and gave me a lecture for wearing a sleeve to hair one time. And yet he would get women to take their clothes off totally. So it, just go figure. It was pretty wild. But I felt so unworthy that I was willing to be part of that. All right, so I wanna get into the nuts and bolts of this in terms of the scientific research. It turns out that one of the operative principles in this kind of scenario is something called licensing effect. I love studying psychology because I discover things like this and it has powerful applications to spiritual things. So I want to try to define licensing effect and then share with you some research that studied licensing effect. So licensing effect is the belief that past good deeds can liberate individuals to engage in behaviors that are immoral, unethical, or otherwise problematic. That's what's going on with this guy. He did good deeds, he didn't eat dairy, he dressed right, quote unquote, checked all the boxes, and then he thought, well, I can have a few women on the side, and it's okay because it all balances out. That's what he believed. This is an interesting study. In one study, individuals who endorsed Barack Obama during the 2008 presidential election were more likely to express racist views in other contexts. Do you see what's going on here? You figure, well, I did something good, then I have some change in the bank and I can do something wrong. All right, let's look at some of the research that shows how licensing effect works. So this is study number one. The participants imagined, they didn't actually do it, but they imagined doing community service. And then were given a choice as to whether to buy a luxury item like designer jeans or a utilitarian item. Okay, so they just imagined, they didn't even do it, but they imagined doing community service and then they were given money and they were told to buy either the designer jeans, a luxury item, or the utilitarian item. The control group only chose between the two items. So and guess which one bought the designer jeans? The people that had imagined doing community service or the people that had not? The people that thought of themselves as virtuous because they imagined doing community service were more likely to buy the extravagant item. Same results from a study involving sunglasses. Participants imagined donating money to a charity and then they chose between utilitarian sunglasses, the ones that I get like at Walmart, 
you know, that are, because I'm not going to get expensive sunglasses because I lose them all the time. So I get these $5 sunglasses that literally fall off my face on a regular basis. Or designer sunglasses. Guess who bought uh, more fancy sunglasses? The people that imagined donating money to charity. Okay, study number three. The participants were asked to commit to helping a foreign student and then asked to donate money. The people that committed to helping a foreign student donated what? Less or more money? How many think more money? If they committed to helping a foreign student, did they, did they give away less money or more money? Raise your hand if you thought it was less. What about more? It was less because they'd done a good deed, so then they could be stingier. You see? All right, this is one more study. I know it's confusing, but this is how human nature is, so it's very insightful. Okay, so this study involved a group of people, they were given money, and they were to do two things with the money. They were to purchase cleaning products, either green or conventional cleaning products. You know what I mean by green? So if they're green, you're helping the environment. So that's like an act of virtue is to buy that green product, right? Or at least in some people's minds, it's an act of virtue. I kind of doubt whether it really makes a difference, but okay, maybe it does. So buying the green would give a sense of virtue. Then they were told to give some of the money away. Who gave more money away? How many people think the people that bought green gave more money away? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people think that the people that brought conventional gave more money away, you're correct. Because of licensing effect. Okay, let's look at some more comments about licensing effect. This one really nails it. Licensing effect might be at work. When we engage in a good deed, that gives us a kind of satisfaction, says the author of this study. With that self-satisfied feeling can come tacit permission to behave more selfishly. You see what's going on here? This is why you see religious institutions that are entirely grounded in the idea that you can alleviate the demerit that comes from bad works by doing what? Or by going to convention, um, to confession, sorry, or by, <laughs> it was a Freudian slip because Adventists have conventions, but, um, or, or by indulgences. You can buy your loved one's way out of purgatory see by doing good things you can take away the effect of bad things isn't that familiar I came when I became a Christian I had been really involved in Hinduism and I believed in reincarnation my grandmother died during that time and I reasoned that she could come back as a cow and so I stopped eating meat at that time because <laughs> I didn't want to eat my grandmother but I believed in reincarnation and that if you did good deeds in your life, you would come back as a higher life form. If you did bad deeds in your life, you'd come back as a lower life form. My grandmother is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> no, she was a good person. She was a good person, so I knew she'd come back as a human being, not a frog or something. But you know how this works. Um, doing good can cover up the bad, right? It's checks and balances. That is nothing but Edenic self-righteousness institutionalized and that self-righteousness is such a basic human reaction to that core of shame we acquired from our bent towards sin that is how we are we're always going to try to compensate for that shame and that guilt by trying to generate our own righteousness and guess what it really doesn't work you know a few years ago um, well, actually, not a few years ago. It happened a few years ago, but it happened more recently. Last year, those of you that follow me on social media know that my house flooded. We have a field adjacent to our house, and whenever the water levels rise, it breaks the surface of the ground. So the reality is everything in Florida is what? It's not dirt. It's sand and so all there has to be is some kind of water way down deep in that sand and the water will build up as a result of all the rains and eventually break the surface and this is how shame works there's that water table of shame 
And eventually, when the rains come down and there's enough stress in our lives, that shame will bubble up and break the surface and become discernible. But it's always there. It's always there like a water table. So here are some of the types of shame we see breaking the surface, so to speak, body shame. Particularly young people are struggling with this, and this is part of what's leading so many young people to try to transition into another sex because they don't like how they look. There's something about puberty that makes young people more self-conscious, particularly female young people. And by the way, the spike in what's called rapid onset gender dysphoria where it onsets in the teen years. It has always traditionally onsetted in elementary school age kids, but now it's onsetting in the teen years, and there's a huge spike in that, I think largely mediated by social factors, but it's higher in women than men, and I think it's because women are more self-conscious with puberty than men are, and there's that body shame that drives them to want to just do something with their body. They're not happy with the way they are. And so some of them think that they can become boys. So there's body shame. There's behavior shame. When you do something wrong and you feel ashamed maybe of something you do repeatedly. There's mind shame, feeling like you're not as intelligent as other people. There's material shame where you don't have as much as other people and you can feel very ashamed of your comparative poverty. There's religious shame when you feel less holy compared to other people. I remember this when I was a new Adventist because I didn't know anything about how to be a Christian or how to live the life, you know, and I would make mistakes just because I didn't know. And I remember these little kids would correct me, you know, because I lived in a house with some friends and these little kids and I would accidentally say, I'm going to go to Sunday school because that's how I grew up, with Sunday school, and they'd go, Sabbath school, it's Sabbath school, you know. <laughs> I'd feel this religious shame, like these little kids have to tell me how to be religious. You know, it was really interesting. Collective shame, uh, where we all feel ashamed of something that happened. Often this will happen in a community. If a community member murders someone, for instance, we'll feel a sense of, oh, that's so terrible, it happened here. That's collective shame. And then social shame, feeling restricted or, or rejected or left out or excluded socially. It can be helpful in understanding shame to distinguish between shame and guilt. So I'm gonna share this with you and then I'm gonna bring this plane in for a landing. All right, so guilt is a little bit different than shame. Guilt says I did wrong, shame says I am wrong. Guilt says uh, sin or sin, I don't expect any different. Shame says sin is unique to me. So shame tends to isolate us. Guilt says, I fail sometimes. Shame says, if I fail, I'm a failure. So look how shame personalizes our, our mistakes and failings. Guilt can tend to say, you know, I feel bad about what I did, but there is forgiveness. But shame tends to think, well, this is permanent. I'm ruined. Guilt says, this is about them. Shame says, this is about me. So when you feel guilty, you're more capable of saying, I hurt someone and I feel bad for how they feel because of what I did. But shame complete, quickly makes it about you and your sense of shame and failure. And then guilt says, how did you feel? And shame says, how do I feel? So let's look at some research on this. Uh, shame drives blame because how can I take responsibility if I can't do anything right? If it's just me that's flawed then I can't make the right choice, so how can I take responsibility? Okay, so here's from some research on guilt proneness versus shame proneness. Guilt proneness involves a working model of self that is humble about personal limitations. Shame proneness involves a more narcissistic working model of self. Does that make sense? So guilt says, you know, I make mistakes. Shame says, I'm not allowed to make mistakes. This is because of me. It makes it about me. So experiencing a lot of shame in your life is going to predict a number of conditions, including low self-esteem, hostility, social anxiety, depression, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and so forth. And the scriptures seem to also not really like the effect of shame. Let's read Psalm 25, 1 to 3. And you, you want to read it with me? Lord, my God. I put my trust, I trust in you. 
Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. So we can see that shame is gonna drive us into isolation, it's gonna drive us into a self-defeating, self-referencing -reference, that keeps us from being able to access the forgiveness of God. But I'm gonna throw a wrench in the works here and say that even though shame is more problematic than guilt, it still has a, a place. We are wrong. You know, shame says, I am wrong. We are wrong. We are fallen. We are bent towards sin. And if we don't allow any shame in Christian experience, it can backfire because people develop dis secondary disturbance when they're ashamed of being ashamed. So I don't think it's healthy for us to put across to God's people that having any kind of shame or guilt, either one, is completely inappropriate. I think there will be times when we feel ashamed of ourselves. And certainly will be times when we feel guilty for things we've done, and that's part of a normal, healthy Christian experience. But it's very important what we do with that guilt and shame because they can quickly take over. Would you agree? And isn't that a balance that I'm sharing here? We don't want to catastrophize guilt and shame. They're a normal part of being sinful people trying to follow in God's righteous way, and we're going to fall short and know that we are sinful. But on the other hand, those things can quickly take over and press us down into all kinds of discouragement and despair that we don't need to have. So I want to try to find that balance. There's a study that was done of 476 inmates. Oops, sorry. I was not forwarding my slides. They found that the shame-prone were more likely to reoffend. The shame-prone were also more likely to blame others. But they found that the shame-prone who didn't blame others were no less likely to reoffend than guilt-prone inmates. So the possibility that shame could be harnessed for social good, the researchers said, is tantalizing. Well, how can we make sure that it is harnessed for social good rather than destroying us. Do you want to know? Yes. Amen. Okay, let's go to that question. What do we do with shame? This is a cycle. Have you ever seen a cycle like this where you feel shame and the shame itself, I mean, think about it, shame is very uncomfortable. I can tell you that based on having burnt a house down and feeling that burning shame it was pretty bad. Those are uncomfortable feelings. What do we do when we feel uncomfortable? We want to self-medicate. And don't we often take up with some kind of sinful addiction to try to take away that discomfort? And so shame can drive us right into the arms of the very sin that made us ashamed in the first place. We see this with pornography addiction. We see it with substance abuse. I don't know if the guy that talked about 12 steps, are you relating? Are you picking up what I'm putting down here? Yeah, I figured. So it will drive us right into the thing that made us ashamed to dig in with. Sin leads, often becomes addictive, causes damage, which causes pain, which causes more shame, and we can end up in a terrible, rapidly cycling, negative cycle of sin and shame. The cure. Do you want to know what the cure is, guys? You don't want to know what the biblical remedy is? I'm going to grab my phone here. What is the biblical remedy? What is the biblical remedy for sin and shame? Anybody have a guess? Okay, you're, yeah. Here it is, Romans 2, 4 to 6. Do you despise the riches of, read it with me, the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? Repentance. repentance. Guys, repentance has gotten a bad rap. Repentance is one of the most healing, powerfully therapeutic experiences we can have as human beings. God is leading us to repentance. We can have some guilt and shame, but we want it ultimately to lead us to the foot of the cross. So the passage goes on. But in accordance with your hardness of your impenitent heart, 
You are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. And then it describes true repentance. And by the way, the backstory of this is that in the church in Corinth, there was a couple, there was a mother-in-law and a son-in-law that were involved in this incestuous relationship the whole congregation knew about. And Paul wrote them a letter rebuking not the guy that was involved in the incestuous relationship, but rebuking the elders for doing nothing about it. Very interesting story. So he wrote this letter and it was rather pointed and he felt bad about it later. He just wondered if he had wounded them beyond salvage. But what happened was instead of being wounded, they responded with a deep, heartfelt, collective, corporate repentance of that church. They came to their senses, so to speak. And this is what Paul says about that repentance. He says, you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So what I've done here is I have taken those words and tried to build off of what Paul meant by them. This is what true repentance looks like. That diligence means you're very intentional about dealing with the problem. Clearing means complete confession, what this sister just said. Indignation is an abhorrence of the sin in which you engaged. Fear is an appropriate fear of God and his holiness. Vehement desire is a passion for restitution in that situation. And zeal is an intense purpose and vindication is a vindication, not of you, because you're the one that sinned, but of the innocent person involved in that. You know, one of the most poignant illustrations that we can see in scripture of the difference between true repentance and basically self-centered repentance is Peter and Judas. What they actually did was not that different. Judas did not really believe Jesus would go through with the cross. He thought it would just sort of shake him up when he betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver and that somehow he would ex get himself out of that situation and not ultimately be condemned under Roman law. He didn't think Jesus would follow through with it. And that's why when he saw that he would, he went out and did what? And hanged himself in utter remorse, but it was a self-centered remorse. Peter, on the other hand, was just as broken. He had made just as glaring a mistake. And we're told one of the, the second shortest verse in the Bible, I think, is right after Peter denied Jesus the third time with cursing and swearing, it says Jesus looked at Peter. And we're told in the book Desire of Ages that there was pity in that look and compassion, but there was no anger. And that Peter then went out, stumbled out into the night and ended up in the Garden of Gethsemane. Maybe he was right there where Jesus had prayed. Maybe there was still blood on the rocks. But Peter threw himself down and wished he could die. He was so overwhelmed with remorse for what he had done. But the Lord was able to get hold of him that night, see. And Peter, the great denier, went on to become the great proclaimer. That's the power of repentance. And his repentance wasn't perfect, and he made mistakes again. We're all sinful, but it was what God had brought him to at that point. Peter experienced a complete overhaul of his personality as the result of that repentance. Now, it's not going to be for all of us that dramatic. But in little ways, we can bring our sins to Jesus. And the more consistently we do that, see, it ultimately doesn't matter if you've got guilt, shame, or whatever you have, bring it all to him. And lay it down at the foot of the cross and say, mea culpa, Lord, I am a sinful human being. I pray every morning, I use the acronym P-R-A-Y. Praise God, repent, <laughs> you know, admit that I'm a sinner, even if I can't think of anything specific, although often I can. <laughs> and then ask and then yield. I love that acronym. And this is what we need to do consistently, is tell God to show us wherein we have fallen short of what his plan is for us, 
and then surrender ourselves and all of the shame and guilt that come with our sinful condition to him at the cross. And I'm convinced if we do that, that shame and that guilt can work in our behalf for our growth instead of overcoming us because we serve a risen savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. God is alive and he is a forgiving and loving savior. I wanna close with a poem. Sometimes expressions hold half hidden truth like a rare orchid deep in a forest like the lack that we show when we say, shame on you, when those words make the shamer the poorest. But that shame was indeed placed on one of great store who bore all of our sin to reclaim us and receiving his gift while it proves us is poor, tells of mercy that rendered us blameless. Shame on you, Jesus. Shame on you. Shame on the one to whom no shame was due. Shame you despised and then took to the tree where the shame was on you and the grace was on me. Sometimes we try to diminish the curse, the essential foundational scandal. We try putting it off on someone even worse or think shrinking it down we can handle. But that shame can't be shrunk. It's too glaring to hide and we don't have the power to throw it. So it must be released to the one crucified in a way that deep down we can know it. Shame on you, Jesus. Shame on you. Shame on the one to whom no shame was due. Shame you despised and then took to the tree where the shame was on you and the grace was on me. We will never exhaust it, the theme of this love that placed infinite love in the worst place. And then in return, all he asks is the shame that put him on the cross in the first place. Shame on you, Jesus. Shame on you. Shame on the one to whom no shame was due. Shame you despised and then took to the tree where the shame was on you and the grace was on me. How many of you want to say, um, I want to give you all the shame that put you on the cross in the first place, Jesus. I want to do that right now, right here. Can I get you to come pray with me? Let's hold hands or something. It's really hard to have a circle in a <laughs> church where there's views. Sorry about that. I should have thought of that. I should have just told you to come up front. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> so cute. All right. Father in heaven. Just praise you, thank you. Your Holy Spirit has come and touched our souls. And we can see that you were shamed and we walked free because of the grace you gave us. It is the great exchange, Lord. There's no way around it. There's no way to philosophize it away. You took what we deserve so that we could be treated as you deserved. You were condemned for our sins that we might be justified. You suffered death, which was ours, that we might live the life that is yours. And by you, earth and heaven are bound together and enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. Lord, enfold us now in that love and heal our shame wounds. Help us not to pass them on generation to generation, relationship to relationship. Help us to love one another simply and in Jesus. Heal us deeply, we pray. Bring us to repentance moment by moment, day by day is our prayer in Jesus' name.